the things he was saying was, you know, self-empower, you've got to be your own boss. And, you know, he just started to really talk to everybody up. So the whole purpose of us going was to be better salespeople. But when I saw that uh, seminar, it did something else to me. It made me think, you know what, I've got to just, I got to get out and do it on my own. So I gave John my two-week notice, and I said, <laughs> John said, that wasn't the purpose of me bringing you to the seminar. I didn't think you were going to quit. <laughs> but then um, I, I ended up getting one of these low-power AM transmitters in 1994, <laughs> and they are FCC legal. They operate without a license, and they get out about two square miles. That's, that's about it. I mean, we're talking about very, very low power, a tenth of a watt. Part 15 of FCC rules allows you to broadcast 100 milliwatts in an antenna and ground lead of no more than 10 feet. And I figured out a way to get to get it out about maybe a mile radius, which I guess is about two square miles. And it was covering Dunn's Corners, and that was it. So obviously I, I couldn't, even though I started that, I, I couldn't really make a living off of that, obviously. So I ended up working for another radio station, licensed to Block Island, 99.3, which had the call letters WBLQ. BLQ stood for Block Island. That's where BLQ came from. And I was hired by a gentleman by the name of Rick Edwards, also known as Richard Perlman, that's his real name, the program director of the station. And John taught me all there was to know about sales. Rick taught me everything there was to know about programming. So I got the best of both worlds. I learned about sales from John Fuller, then I learned about programming from Rick. And the old WBLQ on 99.3 was, uh, it, was, it was a fun time in my life. That, that was the non-business part of radio, where we just basically were DJs. We got on the air and we played whatever the hell we wanted within a certain structure. He was trying to make it a, an all-request rock and roll radio station, but some crazy things played on that station. I don't ever know how it got on the air. It was, it was a very loose format. But I had a lot of fun there, and I was very sentimental about it. That station was sold to the Urso family in uh, January of 1996, and the Ursos uh, took the radio station. It had its studios in Narragansett uh, when, it, when I worked there, and they moved the studios into their Railroad Avenue location, where they already owned 1230 WERI, and they made it WERI-FM. It was actually the second incarnation of WERI-FM. They had those call letters once before on 103.7, and since there was no WERI-FM for many years, they renamed 99.3 WERI-FM. So they were running it out of Westerly. It's still a Block Island station. That's where the tower is. The hmm. city of license doesn't change. But the studios you can basically put anywhere, as long as it's within like a 25-mile radius of wherever the broadcast antenna is. So when the Ursos took over that station, WBLQ, those call letters, became available to anybody east of the Mississippi River. Now, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but uh, everything around here starts with a W. If you go out to the West Coast, uh, what does everything begin with, John? K. K, K. very good, K. Mm -hmm. Well, anything actually that, was, that went on the air after the Telecommunications Act of 1936, because there was no FCC before 1936, which is why KDKA in Pittsburgh that's starts with a K, and that's east of the Mississippi River. And so. it's the only one. No, there's a couple. There's a couple more besides that, but not many. Not many, though. So after um, the Ursos took that station over, I was just like trying to find, you know, licenses, licenses. I still have my low power AM operation. So I did something kind of, uh, kind of crazy. I put another low power transmitter up in downtown Westerly from a little studio at Four Canal Street. So now I had two transmitters broadcasting in 1620, one in Dunn's Corners that I fed by phone line and then another one in downtown Westerly. They both got out the same distance, about two square miles, but that's when I met people like Pauly Juncarella at Toscano's Men's Shop, who would play the station in his store all the time. And there was a little place down the road from Canal Street. Mario Capone had a place called Cafe Espresso, and he used to play it in his place all the time. And, and the, only, uh, the only prerequisite was that I had to play like two Italian songs an hour. <laughs> <laughs> So I did all of that just so they would play my radio station. Hmm. So anyway, in 1996, Sales. I met a gentleman by the name of Ed Perry in Marshfield, Massachusetts, who owned W, still owns today, WATD 95.9 in Marshfield, Massachusetts. 
and I was doing a little research along with a couple of other radio friends of mine and discovered that he does frequency searches because you can't just turn a radio station on the air. You have to go through a long process with the FCC. So he's one of these, we call them consulting engineers. So he did some research. I paid him some good money, uh, very reasonable though, to do a frequency study for the westerly area. And it was discovered that you could actually stick a channel in on 88.1 in the east side of westerly or in parts of Charlestown, you could stick it there too. There was another one already licensed to Providence at the time, and you had to protect channel six, because channel six, uh, back in the analog days, uh, was 87.75, and 88.1 is very close to 87.75. Does anybody remember being able to tune in channel six on your FM radio? Mm -hmm. Well, you can't do that anymore, because everything's digital. So anyway, 88.1, we found out that that could work, and after filing the application in 1996, about a year later, exactly a year later, July 14th, uh, 1997, the FCC granted the license for 88.1 uh, in Dunn's Corners, and I filed for the latitude and longitude coordinates of my grandparents' house, the Champlins in Dunn's Corners, because they had a little utility pole in the back of their house that they used to use for Citizens Band, for CB radio. and. Lo and behold, built the radio station. They have a train service. To this day, they still have a train service, Champlin train service. Hoisted me up in the bucket and uh, <laughs> with a good friend of mine who's a good engineer, Steve Conti, and uh, the help of a few other people, we put that antenna up on the pole, uh, ran a, an RG8 cable down. I buried it underground, which my grandmother yelled at me for later because I dug up her lawn, and uh, <laughs> ran it into the basement. The license was uh, granted. Uh, with first the construction permit, then the license, and then we officially went on the air December 8th, 1997, and actually had a little studio in the basement of my grandparents' house. Um, but I already had the place on 4 Canal Street in downtown Westerly that I was running my little low-power AM. So once everything was working, I called the phone company, which at the time I think was Bell Atlantic, and uh, ran a dedicated line from Canal Street all the way over to Dunn's Corners, which back then cost like I think $400 a month for a stereo circuit because they based it on distance because you had left and right, it was FM. So we ended up broadcasting from Canal Street and we did the same thing. I took those call letters WBLQ because they were available and at the time they were familiar in a lot of people's head. As a matter of fact, Jerry Duhamel was a caller to the old 99.3 and he ended up becoming a, an on-air personality over at 88.1 <laughs> because he was a caller. So, and uh, he, he played I always joked with him, he played B-52s once an hour. <laughs> Maybe not that much, but anyway, we were at our Canal Street studio for about a year, maybe a year and a half, and then I caught wind that 12.30 a.m. WERI was selling. And at the time, I was thinking, wow, I can't believe they're selling that radio station. It's been on the air since 1949, um, you know, with the local station for years. So I... I slightly altered the format of 88.1, and we weren't just a rock and roll station, we, were more, we became more of a full service station. When WERI was sold to Boston University, they, they ran NPR on the radio station, uh, which would be for the next 10 years. So we kind of inherited all of the WERI programming on 88.1, um, while continuing to do all of the local community things that, you know, that were very important to being a local radio station. So. We ended up moving WBLQ from Canal Street to Dunn's Corners because then president of the Westerly Community Credit Union, Joe Cugini, uh, said, Chris, I think it's great that you're keeping local radio around and I've got a great studio location for you. We've got this space where Dan Lease Realty used to be in Dunn's Corners and I'd love for you to go there. He worked out a great deal with me and in 1999, February of 1999, we moved into the uh, Westerly Community Credit Union, Dunn's Corners branch, and that's where we broadcast from 1999 all the way up until June 1st of 2007. <laughs> now, in the mid-2000s, not everything was peaches and cream. I mean, I, I made some financial mistakes over the year, but everything's a risk. You don't know what you're doing. You sometimes you make investments in the wrong places and whatnot, and I never realized that you could you know, do a little more with 88.1, I found that out later. 
but I also wanted a commercial radio station eventually. And going around, basically, it, this is the other thing, too.